I was raised in a Jewish community where a working knowledge of Jewish success was instilled very early. Ethnic pride was a central pillar of our identity. Whereas once our, our pantheon might have been occupied by, let me actually switch this off, I'm going to see if you can hear me without this. Whereas, can you hear me in the back? Okay. Whereas once our pantheon might have been occupied by Torah sages and Talmudic luminaries, our idols uh, were an ever-updated list of Jewish authors, Jewish artists, Jewish business people, and Jewish sports stars. These were our matriarchs and our patriarchs. Film credits were scoured for Jewish-sounding names, which in truth is an exercise much like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> in the age before Wikipedia, the name itself, or a vague sense of a person, or rumor of a person's Jewishness, was often all we needed to claim him or her as one of our own, particularly if the individual was a desirable addition to our virtual deck of Jewish trump cards. So this strange form of vicarious pride might have taken on particular resonance in South Africa, uh, where Jews under apartheid were treated as white but could never be, uh, have aspired to be total insiders in society that privileged white Afrikaners. So, but given the oddities of South Africa, our revered list of, uh, and revered and long list of, of Jews who um, included those who played for the, the Springbok rugby team, the national rugby team, as well as Nobel Prize winners, Nadine Gordimer for literature, Sidney Brenner for, for, for medicine, Aaron Klug for chemistry, Michael Levitt for physics, and there are South African Jews in the audience who can add to my, my list. <laughs> Jews account for a third of all Nobel Prizes awarded to South Africans. Not a bad haul for a Jewish community that numbers never numbered more than 120,000. Yet I don't think it is debatable whom South African Jews care most about. No question that Joel Stransky's winning kick in the final of the 1995 Rugby World Cup, <laughs> scene which is memory, memorably recreated in the film Invictus, trumps the Nobel Prizes any day. <laughs> There are obviously American equivalents to what I've just described. Who here doesn't know the names of the three Jewish Supreme Court justices? Who hasn't heard of Sandy Koufax and Hank Greenberg? Or doesn't delight that, that there are too many American Jewish and Israeli Nobel Prize winners to name? But it is not only the success of Jewish superstars that is phenomenal. That of the broader Jewish community is extraordinary as well. And let me draw this important contrast. 100 years ago, the vast majority of Jews in America were recent immigrants, part of this tidal wave of perhaps 2.4 million Jews who made their way to these shores between 1881 and 1914. Most of these Jews arrived extremely poor. They had fled persecution, but also lives of deep poverty. Contrary to the, the, the conventional wisdom, Few of these Jews brought skills with them. Instead, the traditional areas of the Jewish economic activity in Eastern Europe had been in free fall for decades. Most of these people had only very limited work experience or had been lifelong North mentioned. Many of these immigrants had very, very little work experience. And in more than that, very little work experience that would be relevant to a modern industrial economy of the kind they found when they came to the United States. The majority of these newcomers initially found work in the garment industry, the schmatter business. These were the stitchers and sewers of garments in a low-wage, high-volume occupation, by far the most common occupation for Eastern European immigrants. Working conditions were extremely unpleasant, with workers crowded together in makeshift spaces, heavy with glue vapors, fabric particles, steam and smoke, and are overheated by the press of bodies and the hissing of irons. Together with the marginal wages paid to, to workers and the prevalence of strife between bosses and laborers, this was no ideal introduction to America. So, what if, so if what I've just described reflects the experience of the majority of Jews when they first started in America, let's jump forward 100 years, roughly, to today. Today, Jews are widely regarded by sociologists, by economists, and by historians as the single most economically successful group in American history. There's quite wide consensus on this. They are amongst the edgiest entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, the foremost bankers on Wall Street, and among the leading lights in Hollywood. But those who hog the headlines are only a small part of a much broader phenomenon. Jews are exceptionally well represented in the professions, 
and firmly part of the American middle class. And their average earnings as a group set them apart from almost every other ethnic group in America. So the economic ascent of Jews in America has been exceptional. Other ethnic groups clearly have prospered, but Jews stand out by several measures. So the question is, why have Jews prospered so dramatically and so emphatically in the United States over a relatively brief space of time? What was the precise alchemy that transmuted these economically abased immigrants into America's most successful citizens? How, within a handful of generations, did they move upward so quickly from stitching in sweatshops to positions of prominence and preeminence within, within the American economy and more broadly within American society? And this is actually the question, as we'll see, which is at the heart of my book. You'd think this question about Jewish success would have been debated by sociologists and by historians. Yet as much as we celebrate Jewish success, scholars haven't spent much time trying to explain it. It's actually been a very touchy subject that has been largely avoided since the 1920s. Scholars, for obvious reasons, have not wanted to give ammunition to anti-Semites, or in turn, to be accused of suggesting that Jews are exceptional. And there are plenty of theories about Jewish success, but as I said, very little research to back it up and plenty of questions, but very few proven answers. Do Jews possess an innate acumen for business? Do they carry a hard-won facility with commerce, born of a history of surviving at the margins of, Ameri of European society to America's shores? Do they share a flexibility and adaptability derived from a history of mobility, dispersion, and expulsion? Or perhaps they share a cultural affinity towards trade, towards risk-taking, and towards making money? Have they acquired an ease with the market, with money and salesmanship that set them apart from other immigrant groups? And have they been aided by a predisposition towards learning and towards literacy? Do they harbor the ambition, the drive, the perspective of perpetual outsiders? Or were they merely the beneficiaries of fortunate timing? Or is their success a product of clannishness and conspiracy as some less favorably disposed Jews have suggested. So most explanations about Jewish success focus on cultural factors. At least that's been the, more, the dominant way of thinking about Jewish success more recently. Mm -hmm. Answering yes to just about all the questions I just posed. Arguing in essence that Jews are exceptional. And popular works like the recent book, The Battle Hymn of the Tiger, uh, a tiger Mother, um, focusing on Chinese immigrants in America, America, makes the same claim about Jews. That Jews are thriftier. The Jews are harder working. They are more invested in their futures, perhaps, than other Americans. But again, beyond these assumptions and stereotypes, there is very little work to back up these claims and these assertions. And why do these assertions and these explanations of, for Jewish success actually matter? What's, is this a question even worth investigating? It turns out that understanding Jewish success is not just an academic issue. Because if Jewish culture is exceptional, and if success in America is determined largely by these cultural factors, then there is almost nothing that Jewish success, uh, about Jewish success that other groups, other immigrant groups to America can replicate. In other words, there's no lessons from uh, Jewish success, Jewish upper mobility, which can apply to more recent immigrant groups to America. But if culture, by contrast, is only a small part of the story, then there is more, obviously, about the experience of Jews in America that can teach, uh, that we can learn and teach uh, more, Im more recent immigrant groups. In other words, if you can find explanations and lessons in the Jewish experience that is replicable, our history matters much more to the future of the newest Americans. Although I don't completely discount these cultural factors and these cultural explanations, my book places its emphasis entirely elsewhere. I'm not interested, or much less interested, in these cultural explanations. I argue, and I'll talk about what my book describes in some detail, that the Jews who flocked to America during the century of mass migration that stretched from 1820 to 1924 were aided immeasurably by their association with a particular corner of the American economy that they turned into a home of their own. But, I argue, for the particular opportunities and circumstances that they encountered within this particular corner of the economy, their upward mobility might have been very different. The experience might have been very different. I argue, in essence, 
that culture was only a small part of the story of Jewish success. To really understand Jewish success, we need to look at a range of other factors that my book discusses. So how did I reach this conclusion? I certainly did not set out to write a book about Jewish success. Instead, I had a much more modest uh, ambition of understanding how and why generations of Jewish immigrants to these shores became entangled with the rag trip, the schmutter business. So really, I set out to write a book about schmutters. <laughs> but by comparing the trajectory of Jews in America with those in the British Empire, so I was looking at the schmutter trade on both sides of the Atlantic, Jews who clustered in the identical industry in different places, I began to see these curious patterns that could not be explained by the cultural baggage of the Jews in each setting. For because the Jews who immigrated to America were not much different from those who landed up in the East End of London or in Leeds or elsewhere in England. But, as we'll see, their economic mobility was entirely so. Jews in America are much more economically mobile than those in, in England. Could there be, I wondered, something about the rag trade itself in each place that explains the extraordinary economic ascent of Jews in the United States and the slower ascent of Jews in, in England? Why, in other words, do Jews in England proceed out of the working class much more slowly? Why do they instead um, take much longer to reach middle class status than, than Jews in, in, in America? I came to see that the rag trade wasn't just any occupation. It proved to be a particularly good fit for Jews. I have to, have to apologize now that my book is full of, and my talk is full of these really bad puns. I, I had to make sure. <laughs> it's better than it once was. <laughs> By dint of good timing, I argue that Jews entered uh, this trade, the garment industry, en masse, and, and largely by happenstance, by chance. It's not as if they actually seek it out as, a, as, some, as an area they know is going to grow. And they not only do they enter it en masse and by happenstance, but they also do it at the perfect moment, by, again, by chance. By dint of good fortune, the nature of the trade in America was very different from the nature of the garment industry in England. Um, it encouraged entrepreneurship far more, uh, the rate of entrepreneurship was far higher in America than in England. And crucially for Jews in America, unlike Jews in England, they exited the trade at a good moment before it became a mobility trap. Again, unlike Jews in England, they stay in the clothing trade longer and will have long-term repercussions for this Jewish community. The, trade, the clothing trade, in other words, became this springboard for Jews in America, but much less so for Jews in, in England. What I came to see was that from very humble beginnings, Jews rode the coattails of the clothing trade, I apologize again, <laughs> the margins of economic life in the 19th century to this unusual position of promise and, 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 uh, and prominence in the 20th century. Yes, Jews worked hard without question. I'm not discounting here the role of agency, the role of effort, the role of good fortune and other such things, but they could hardly, I argue, have moved ahead so quickly without schmatters, without this particular trade. And this intimate relationship that developed between Jews and the clothing trade had long-term consequences for both. You can't, I argue, understand the economic extent of Jews in America without understanding the clothing trade, and you can't understand the clothing business without understanding the role played by Jews. So I found that the nature of the economic niche mattered, particularly the early history of, of Jewish involvement in it. The early history of Jewish involvement in the garment industry, I argue, is particularly important. And this is different from how the garment industry is most often <coughs> described by uh, historians of the garment industry and of Jewish immigration. Whereas most histories of Jews in the garment industry begin and end in the sweatshops of the Lower East Side of Manhattan, I argue that the developments long before uh, Jews made their way to the Lower East Side made it possible for later Eastern European Jewish immigrants to, su to succeed. In America, Jews entered the clothing industry much earlier, and they entered the, uh, the insalubrious underside of the trade, really at the beginning of the 19th century, long before Western <coughs> European Jews made their way to the United States. Starting in the, in the 1830s, residents, if you were to travel, for example, to New York, <coughs> residents and visitors to the city began to complain about the volubility and the vigor of Jewish salesmen. Um, who would waylay passing pedestrians in Chatham Street. Chatham Street doesn't really exist anymore, but if you know <coughs> East Broadway, it's right now in the heart of Chinatown, um, that was a, a, then a major commercial uh, hub, particularly second-hand trade, very much associated 
with, with Jews. It would be Jewish second-hand clothing trade required very little capital to, to, capital to open a store, and none at all if you wanted to begin by scouring the streets for discarded garments or bartering for discarded garments with, um, with households. But Jewish clothing dealers in New York and Baltimore and Philadelphia, we see other clusters of second-hand traders um, elsewhere, were only a small part of the story. The peddling of fancy goods, of notions, and clothing to rural customers became a rite of passage for uh, Central European Jews uh, who began to arrive in large numbers in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s. German-speaking Jews who, who, uh, who um, increased the, uh, the size of the Jewish population from, from roughly 4,000 in 1820 to, to close to 150,000 in the 1860s. These are German-speaking Jews who arrive en masse. Most of them will have an experience at some point of peddling either in an urban area or more commonly in, in the countryside. And peddlers <laughs> preferred to, to uh, peddle in the countryside. They're, they're peddling to a dispersed rural population, which was, was ill-served by sedentary shopkeepers, meant that there were plenty of opportunities for these peddlers. They basically advanced behind the frontier, and there is a very imperfect transportation network. There's lots of opportunity if you have the energy and the will to, to, uh, to enter into trade. So why do I describe this period in such depth? In fact, a fair portion of my book talks about the period prior to the, the arrival of Eastern European mass migrants. In America, I argue, this predilection towards peddling, the fact that Central European Jews, German-speaking Jews, uh, uh, become peddlers in such large numbers, produced a cascade of consequences that would have direct, uh, um, a direct impact and direct uh, a consequent, direct implications for the later Eastern European Jewish arrivals. They really set the scene for Eastern European Jews. Because the dispersion of thousands of German-speaking Jews into the American hinterland created what would become, over time, a Jewish distribution system and ultimately would drive the future development of Jewish involvement in the clothing trade. Because from the ranks of these initial peddlers came the manufacturers and wholesalers of ready-made clothing began to expand uh, the frontiers of the garment industry in, in, in the 1850s. Initially, Jews are marginal within clothing, manufacturing in particular. A number of non-Jewish firms like Brook Brothers, Brooks Brothers dominate the clothing business, but I argue because of the Civil War, uh, because of demand for uniforms in the Civil War in particular, Jews enter into the manufacturing of clothing, and Jews are responsible for producing a good portion of the clothing worn, worn by, by Union soldiers. So in essence, I argue that the, the peddling and shopkeeping and the networks between these wholesalers, peddlers and shopkeepers provided a point of entry for a significant number of Jews into garment manufacturing well before these Eastern European Jews began to arrive. And crucially, these same Central European clothing manufacturers, uh, people who'd made their start in the 1840s and 1850s as peddlers and shopkeepers, by the 1870s and by the 1880s, are already wholesalers and manufacturers of, on quite a substantial scale. The, the American market has expanded dramatically to lots of, of new consumers. They can sell new clothing too. And they are in need of a low-wage workforce in the 1880s, exactly the moment that Eastern European Jews begin to arrive. In fact, Eastern European Jews are going to displace um, German and Italian and other uh, tailors from the garment industry. So those immigrants, these Eastern European immigrants, who would come to cluster in the sweatshops on the Lower East Side into an industry, in other words, where Jews were already involved at all levels of the clothing business, from distribution to wholesaling, retailing, and manufacturing. And it's obviously no accident that a disproportionate percentage of Jewish immigrants began as tailors in, in America, became proprietors of small businesses. They basically followed the footsteps of those who came before them. Because these pathways from um, retailing into manufacturing and wholesaling had already, already been well furrowed by the feet of those who came before them. There was precedent for moving from petty manufacturing, from, from sewing clothing and tailoring into these other areas. Because not only did a, an earlier generation of Jews who had made their mark as wholesalers, as clothiers and department store owners, did not only did they present an enticing entrepreneurial model for these newcomers, but in practical terms, the members of that generation 
were still participants in this ever-growing ethnic economy. In other words, Jews, even though there's quite a lot of tension between these Eastern European Jews and these Central European Jews, they don't always see eye to eye. They do often have a number of things in common, including mutual interests in their success. Um, so these Central European Jews act as a point of access for the Eastern European Jews who come after them. And given that the scale of production and demand continue to grow apace in America, the, the demand for clothing only uh, basically increases exponentially in the second half of the 19th century, and given that the industry itself was becoming more sophisticated, more cemented, there was plenty of opportunity for these newcomers to carve out space for themselves. They, they, over time, will take over the manufacturing business from Central European Jews. As, these, as the earlier immigrants left the trade behind or went into department store, uh, uh, running department stores or, or larger scale manufacturing, um, they, were, they, they created what's known as a vacancy chain uh, that was filled by their fellow Jews. So as Jews exited, as Central European Jews exited, these Eastern European Jews would, would take over the, the now vacant positions. In the first two decades of the 20th century, it was relatively inexpensive and easy for an immigrant tailor and, and, or an immigrant seamstress to strike out on their own and to open a workshop or a sweatshop. It actually cost less than $100 to do so. You would either rent or buy the basic machinery that you require to set yourself up as a, a, an independent contractor. And as we well know, many new immigrants worked for others before becoming their own bosses. And often, once they became their own bosses, they would sew alongside their hired workers. The clothing trade, in other words, encouraged entrepreneurship amongst these Eastern, Eastern European Jews. Why would you work for someone else when it was relatively easy, relatively inexpensive, to, to scrape together the money to, to work on your own, to be your own boss? But crucially, the work was still extremely difficult, it was hyper competitive, and very unpredictable. There was a long slack period every season between seasons, with little work to go around. There were few protections for workers and very little regulation in the American garment trade. In effect, ultimately, and this, as I argue, was ultimately being positive for Jews, uh, was that it persuaded Jews and Jewish immigrants to leave this line of work as quickly as they can. You would try and certainly work for yourself, but even more important than that, you try and leave the production side as quickly as you can, get out of the sweatshop trade, and instead get into petty retail or any other number of lines of work. So in other words, there's a continuous exodus, a continuous entry and continued exodus of Jews into and out of sweatshops, uh, those who are exiting, seeking any form of work that they could find. So by the 1920s, while, while mass Jewish immigration is still going on, Jews were outnumbered by Italians in the sweatshops. So we associate Jews with the sweatshop economy. In essence, it's actually a very short period that Jews dominate in the sweatshops, really from the 1890s until uh, the beginning of the 1920s. Italian, Italian men and women will take over from Jews. So Jews get out of the business as quickly as they can, get out of the business of stitching and sewing clothing. But this is very different in, in England. Their Jews remained much longer in the sweatshops of the East End of London and in Leeds. Um, crucially, as we'll see, Jews exited much more quickly, left this work behind. So why does this timing matter? Why do I make such a fuss about you know, when Jews get out of this business? Because it was relatively easy to get out of the sweatshops in the first two decades of the 20th century, but things began to change dramatically thereafter. So by the 1920s, it's much more difficult to, to either set yourself up in business or to leave the sweatshops uh, behind. By the 1920s, Sweatshops that produced menswear and womenswear were struggling to compete with increasingly efficient factories. There is factory production of clothing prior to the 1920s, but certainly it becomes, it becomes much better at competing with sweatshops in the 1920s. Um, by the 1920s, New York is no longer a center of, or the center of the menswear trade. trade. The um, um, Chicago and a number of other cities have, have come to produce much more menswear than has New York. And whereas once, for so example, those first two decades of the 20th century, Jews could aspire to open a sweatshop of their own, the startup costs of a factory are much higher. Whereas it costs less than $100 to open up a sweatshop, it costs are in the region of $2,000 to open up a small factory, which is clearly well beyond the means of, of, of immigrants. And wages were stagnant and declining too. So wages began to dip in the 1920s. 
making it difficult to raise the money needed to strike out on, on one's own if you wanted to become an entrepreneur. So for those who remained in the clothing trade or continued to work in factories or sweatshops, there were fewer pathways into entrepreneurial activity in the garment industry. This is very much the case not only in America but in England too. Italians who followed Jews, as it described, into the sweatshops, into this business of stitching and sewing clothing, found the industry to, to be a mobility trap. In other words, they got in, but they couldn't get out in the same way that Jews did. There was little hope of raising enough money to, to get out, and little hope of becoming one's own boss, because realistically, you could not hope to raise enough money to start a factory. And as I said, it's the same story for Jews in, in England, very much like Italians in, in America. Many Jews in England became stuck in the clothing trade long after it ceased to be a springboard for those with aspirations. So, but not only did the exodus of Jews from the garment, from garment manufacturing, uh, from garment manufacturing, not only was that time, but so too, I argue, was their entry into a variety of other fields in the early decades of the 20s and 50s, mass consumption booms in, in the United States. Um, so Jews are not only exiting the sweatshops at a good moment, but they're also moving into new industries when these new industries are taking off. Some of these Jews who leave the sweatshops behind continue to orbit the clothing trade. There actually are lots of opportunities in the clothing industry if you're not involved in sweatshop labor. Because of its scale and its complexity, the, 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 the garment industry supported a variety of niches that served its needs and depended on it. The increasing complexity of, of the clothing trade created demand for clerks, for accountants, for lawyers, for managers, for advertisers, often the university-educated children of, of immigrants. And also there was plenty of work in department stores, in chain local and, and independent retail stores that began to proliferate again in the early decades of the 20th century. Of the 20th century. Others took flight, completely left the clothing trade entirely, but used their experience in petty retail um, and distribution um, and used this experience in a variety of other fields. Again, timing matters here. In the 1920s, when Jews are exiting, or, um, in the teens and the 20s, when Jews are exiting the clothing trade in large numbers, and a variety of other fields they might have moved into are averse to hiring Jews. It's a period of spiking anti-Semitism in American society as well. In other words, all sorts of potential other economic pathways are closed off to them. Off to them. And this is true both of those without university education and those with university education as well. So instead, they, they don't go into engineering, they don't go into school teaching, they don't go into uh, large utilities or, or into insurance companies, because in most cases, many cases, these are places, these are fields which are not receptive to Jews. Instead, they move into consumer oriented industries where there are few entrenched a few entrenched entrenched competitors into new fields. They're pushed into the new, these new fields because other avenues are closed to them. And these fields, which are relatively well known to us, the film industry, the music business, just two well-known examples of this phenomenon, tended to benefit those like Jews who could create these dense networks of interconnected producers, distributors, and purveyors. In other words, Jews are, are, are evident in these in music and film at, at all levels, everything from being producers to directors to writers, you, you name it, actors. So uh, these are industries which benefit those sort of arrangements. So much as it had for earlier peddlers and petty shopkeepers, these industries, these new consumer industries or growing consumer industries, um, were good for those who had a sensitivity to fashion and a hard-headedness in matters of business. Skeptical Americans, Americans were skeptical of the value of, of aspirational products it could be won over by, through salesmanship. And Jews, again, because these are new industries, because they're industries which often do not have established distribution systems, that Jews go out to sell from storefronts, from suitcases, and from car trunks as traveling salesmen. Um, so this persuasion and persistence could pay off in these industries, much as they had in, in the clothing industry. Um, it was perhaps no accident, that I argue, that several Hollywood moguls and sheet music publishers started as salesmen in the clothing trade. They had they were familiar with the business of, of trying to persuade customers to buy things they didn't necessarily want. Um, <laughs> Morris Brill, who's, who's uh, uh, best remembered today for the, the building in New York that bore his name, uh, the Brill Building, uh, wasn't involved directly in the music business, 
um, but ran a clothing store from, from the ground floor of a brawl building. And there are plenty of other examples of this kind of Jews who are either directly involved in these new industries or are involved at the margins of these new industries, uh, not necessarily understanding how the new industries work, but understanding that there's money to be made in a, in a new and growing field. And in turn, several of these new industries became Jewish industries, became Jewish ethnic niches. Jews, in other words, were pushed into um, a variety of fields of industries that would boom in the 20th century, again by good fortune. It's not as if they necessarily sought these out, it's that other options were potentially closed to them. And they get in, as I said, at the ground floor in a variety of cases. These are Jews who would perhaps prefer to have become doctors and lawyers or teachers and insurance agents. But it was difficult to get into certain fields, therefore they, they went into these undesirable fields, at least initially, fields which are, see, which are seen as the class A, as somewhat disreputable, but there is money to be made and there's not much comp entrenched competition. So instead they enter these fields as I described, like the cosmetics industry, music, the furniture business, clothing <coughs> retail, that was small enough at the time, um, or new enough, that their Jewishness didn't matter very much. And as luck would have it, these <coughs> industries turned out to grow dramatically after the Second World War as, again, consumer demand takes off in the 1950s and 1960s. And again, the pattern is very different in England. as a control group. Jews in England do enter some of these industries, but in much smaller numbers and much later. They don't ride the wave in the same way that American Jews do. They remain stuck in the working class for much, much longer because they struggle to get out of the, the clothing business, and they struggle once they enter a variety of new fields, they do so once these fields have already taken off. So in other words, the beginnings of Jewish prosperity in the United States was not wrought, I argue, by magic and genius. Nor was it product, a product solely of these Eastern European Jew, Jewish immigrants and their children. I argue that obviously that much had occurred before to make their entry into the clothing business possible and then their upward mobility with the clothing industry possible too. I argue, in other words, that and that to be properly understood, the ascent of Jews in the 20th century must be seen in the context of this much longer history. There's nothing inevitable in the rise of Jews, nonetheless, from Chatham Street, from second-hand trade, or from peddling to, uh, to, to being successful in the 20th century. There's all sorts of, of, of unexpected and, and other uh, events which uh, makes their success possible. Equally, there are plenty of dead ends. There are plenty of Jews who fail. I argue that that but for this confluence of forces in the American market, the fortunate positioning of, of Jews on the edges and at the center of the clothing trade, but for their exit from the clothing trade and what turns out to be a good moment, but for the individual effort of Jewish entrepreneurs, the outcome for Jews in the 20th century might have been substantially different. Culture matters, I, I, I agree, uh, but all sorts of other factors matter as well. So to sum up, Jews might have been responsible for making parts of the modern clothing trade in America, but I argue, more than anything else, the clothing trade made Jews in America. Thank you.